around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. David Langford here today, and we'd like to welcome each and every one of you to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It is always my prayer that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is abounding in your heart and in your life, and you're rejoicing as you walk this pilgrimage. You're praising, you're lauding, you're extolling the Lord of glory, and you're giving him the glory that is due his holy name. Certainly, he's worthy of our praise, of our worship, our thanksgiving. He is so worthy because he has done so much for each and every one of this. We began this series <clears throat> several programs back here in Psalms chapter 37 because there's a lot of anxiousness, trepidation, fear, anxiety in the earth. And as I said, I believe it was last week or week before, you're going to witness the evildoers grow exponentially. But we are not to get envious. We are not to react. We are to pray. We are to respond correctly. There's no doubt peace trying to be usurped from the earth through Satan at this particular time. You must be God conscious and God aware of everything in your life. You cannot become apathetic, complacent, lackadaisical. You must have purpose. You must strive with intent. You can't be just waffling around. All of the things that they're doing against Donald Trump is fomenting unrest in the earth. A few weeks ago, Matt Gates, congressman from Florida, was in Iowa and said publicly, the only way you're going to change Washington is by force. <clears throat> If we keep hearing this type of rhetoric and jargon, you will see civil unrest in this nation. I've been very mindful of Atlanta since the last indictment. Do not be surprised if there is great upheaval and Georgia. People are talking about doing things now. Ramsaswamy, the Indian that's running for president, he says if he were elected president, he would do away with the totality of the Department of Justice, the IRS, and the FBI. I could be wrong about the Department of Justice, but I'm certain he said he would do away with the FBI and the IRS. People are now beginning to speak publicly of what they're going to do. This is why I felt led to start teaching on this. Because it's going to look, as never before, that there is without any doubt, any reservation, a two-tiered justice system in America. Oh, Hillary says she's glad to see the laws working as they're supposed to work. She's happy. These people are evil. The Bible says they're evildoers. You know, people sometimes are critical of me 
and some of the things I say. But Psalms 37 verse 1 begins by saying, fret not thyself because of the evildoers. These are evil people. Don't think I'm being uh, rhetorical or, 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 or jargon or, or just flippant speech. No, 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 no. The Bible says these are evil people. Very evil. Very evil. Senator Ron Johnson said the other morning, with Sue Bartiromo, Fox Business, a United States senator from Wisconsin, said publicly, COVID was a premeditated plot against this nation to usurp powers. People are beginning to speak openly. And not long after much words, and verbiage, people will begin to take action. Keep yourself and the love of God, as Jude says to us. You pray, you walk upright before God, you honor God, God will honor you. You pray, you read your Bible, you support God's work, I promise you God will honor you. You have to do them all. You can't pick and choose what you want to do. You have to obey the word of the Lord. You obey God. You keep his words. You honor him with your substance, everything. I promise you God will will watch over you, and God will take care of you. But you have to be obedient to the Lord. There's a scripture in 1 John 2, verse 4. Now listen to this, and I'll get off my little hobby horse soapbox. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. He that saith, I know him. There are those who say, I know God, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. It's not in him. Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton, all these people that claim to be a Christian. Think of that. 1 John 2, 4 he that saith, I know him, Jesus Christ, and keepeth not his commandments, not the Ten Commandments, but the commandments in the New Testament, is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. God knows whether you're telling the truth or not. We may fool some of the people all the time. We may fool some people some of the time. We never fool God any of the time. You're not going to fool God. Psalm chapter 37, we want to pick up in verse 3 today. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. It seems as though, as I said last week, the wicked are seemingly prospering at this time. You and I must trust in the Lord and pursue righteousness. David declares the redeemed will live in the land. What does that mean? The believers of Christ, the followers of Christ, will inherit the earth while all the while being fed and nourished through the stableness of God's word and his holy presence. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on the coming of the Lord, a lot of emphasis on going to heaven. As I've said for years, they say we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yet Jesus said in heaven, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. 
And I'm working on this new book where I'm trying to put together a timeline from the literal second advent of Christ, and he puts his feet down at the Mount of Olives and the mountain splits. Zechariah says it will cleave, it will split in two, and waters will begin to run out. Part of the waters will go to the Dead Sea. They're called living waters. They'll revive the Dead Sea in a way that man could never imagine. The other portion will go out into the Mediterranean Sea. My point is, God is coming back to the earth. The emphasis should be him returning to the earth and establishing his kingdom, and we focus on what we're going to do in preparation and getting ready for his return to the earth. I was speaking with a dear friend the other day. I was sharing with him some of the things I'm working on, and he gave me a profound word in that he believes what we are doing right now, what you're called to do, how you're working for the Lord in any capacity whatsoever, that will be what you will do in the millennial kingdom. I thought that was a great measure of insight. You're getting prepared now in the natural what you will do for Christ in the millennial reign. When Jesus comes, it's not going to be like most people think. He just comes and obliterates sin, sends all the wicked evildoers to hell, and life is blissful and life is great, which it will be, don't get me wrong, but death will still reign. There will be rebels in the earth. Zechariah 14, I believe it's verse 16, says, heathens. Now that fundamentally talks about Gentiles. But heathens will be in the earth. And think about this. After the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, what does God do? What does Christ do? He allows Satan to be released from the bottomless pit. What does Satan do? He does what he always does. He, go, he comes up upon the breadth of the earth. He deceives the people. He leads a rebellion against Jesus Christ at Jerusalem, the camp of the saints. He leads a rebellion. That tells you there will be sinful people with rebellious hearts in the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. If they did not exist, how could Satan coerce them to lead a rebellion against Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God? How could he do that? What I'm learning during the millennial reign, everyone will still have free will. Everyone will have free will. Now, you and I, to those who get glorified bodies, we will be immortal, we will be incorruptible, so all that I'm speaking of is not applicable to us. If you are immortal and then you are incorruptible, Satan has no way of corrupting you if you're incorruptible. That was the dynamic statement uh, that Christ made to his disciples when he's talking about Satan. He said, he hath nothing in me. The prince of the world cometh, and he hath nothing in me. There's nothing in me that he can appeal to. There will be nothing in those with glorified bodies. No possible way you will fall for Satan's schemes. Why? You're immortal. You're incorruptible. You cannot be affected by these things. So David is telling us that the righteous, those who hold fast to God, we're going to dwell in the land. The earth is our inheritance. Did you know six times in this 37th chapter of Psalms, David repeats six times, we're going to inherit the earth. He understood the second advent and coming of Christ and how he will establish his kingdom in the earth. And Christ will rule from Jerusalem. And David says here in 
verse 3, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. This is about spiritual sustenance more than physical sustenance. The more you feast on the word of God, the more strength you have. The more time you spend in prayer, and the Holy Spirit broods over your life, the more strength you will have. Job 23, 12 said, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He is saying God's word is more important, more significant to me than my natural sustenance, my, my, my baked potato, my, my T-bone steak, my salad. God's word is more than that to my life because the God's word is eternal. Secondly, God's word is inspired by the Holy Ghost. And if the inspired word of God gets in your heart, you will become inspired as well. I hear people talk about depression an awful lot. I know a little bit about depression when my grandmother, my mother, and then my dad passed away in a period of 45 days, I got depressed. But it didn't last. I continued to pray. I remember going outside and going down to, to a, a shed where I stored hay, and I, I was just sitting on a, a, a log and praying, talking to God. Help me. Help me. It wasn't long I came out of that, but I came out because I stayed consistent in my prayer life. I stayed consistent in the word of God, my meditation on him and his word. I meditate on the word of God daily, riding down the road, coming to work this morning. I rehearsed Romans 13, 10. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in uh, riotousness and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness and strife and envy. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Just rehearsing that passage, those four verses, rehearsing them in my mind, this is where I get my strength. This is where I get my inspiration. If the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Ghost and the Word of God has a place of resonance in your heart, you cannot help but being inspired. You cannot help being edified and strengthened by the hand of the Lord. But if you never bother to spend time in prayer, spend time in his word, you will find discouragement. Thus Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. David said in Psalms 119 verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I put in my heart. I've placed it there. I hid it there. Why? It is a treasure. I said the word of God is a glorious, glorious, glorious treasure. Put it in your heart. Hide it in your heart. Meditate on it. Assimilate it, ingest it, digest it, speak it, speak the word. The centurion told Christ, speak the word, and I know my servant will be healed. There is power in the word of God, Psalm 107, 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. God is a, a God of deliverance. He sends the word to deliver us. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. 
Satan sends destruction. God says, look to my word to deliver you from the destruction. Satan seeks to send chaos. Seek my word. Seek my face. I will deliver you from the chaos. Wherever you find yourself, there is without any doubt, no doubt whatsoever, there is an answer for you in the word of God. We need to find that answer. Verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That is a profound statement. That is an immeasurable profundity. We all, every one of us should have a eagerness, a willingness to delight in the Lord. The word delight here in the Hebrew means to be soft and pliable. Can God mold and fashion you into his likeness? People who make pottery have a pottery wheel. They spin it with a pedal. They pedal and spin it. I'm talking old school, nothing electric about it. They have the clay on the wheel, and they have water by their wheel, the pottery spindle wheel. They have water there. Why? They take water so they can mold and fashion that into what they want it to be. You see, the Word of God is water. Ephesians 5 and 26 says that they might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word of God. You begin to serve God. He's the potter. We're the clay. He takes the water of the Word and softens us and makes us pliable where he can mold us into his image and into his likeness. The job of the Holy Spirit is to make us more like Jesus. He wants to make us more like Jesus Christ. He's not trying to make you a better Baptist, a better Church of God, Assembly of God, United Pentecostal, Four Square, Pentecostal Holiness, Presbyterian, Methodist, Anglican. God is trying to make you through the Holy Ghost like his son, like his son. So we must be pliable. We must be soft. We can't be rigid. We'll break. And if there is that rigidity in us, that is why the word of God is like water. It will soften the clay where God can mold and form it as he pleases. Our hearts should always be tender. I know we live in an hour when people's hearts are becoming calloused and hard-hearted. The, the barbarity, the ferocity, the ugliness that is in the earth begs description. But David is encouraging us to be soft, have pliable hearts, so that whatever God has predetermined, predestined, whatever God has willed for your life becomes your desire. I remember reading that many years ago, and it jumped out at me. Because David said, delight thyself also in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. When you submit wholly to Christ, you're praying. You're seeking his face. You're seeking his counsel. Your heart is being softened. And what actually happens in the end is your desire has been conformed to what he has willed. If God gave us everything that we willed for ourselves, we'd be in a mess. We would be in a mess. That's why we don't question the lordship and the authority 
and the sovereignty of Christ our Lord. He knows what is best for us in every sense of the word. But you see, as you pray and you meditate on the word and you ruminate on the word of God and, and you peruse the word of God through your mind and through your heart, your heart is being softened. And as you commune, you fellowship with God, your desire is becoming conformed to what God has willed for your life. See, God's will has already been established. God's will has already been established. It's already established. It is already settled in heaven. It is therefore the desire, or should be the desire of every believer to surrender and become conformed to what he has willed for our lives. So many people struggle with God's will. Ephesians 5, 17 says, Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And the next verse says in verse 18, Ephesians 5 and 18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is in excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. The more you become filled with the Spirit, the more you'll have the understanding of God's will and plan for your life. Too many people try to humanize, rationalize God and his will for their lives. Remember the renowned passage in Romans 12 and 1? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Something has to happen in everyone's mind, the mind. Something has to take place in our mind. If something does not take place in our mind, we're not going to do what we need to do. Why would Paul say to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 4, 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind? We all have a spirit. The difference between humanity and animals, they have a spirit, but we have a soul. They don't have a soul. We have a soul. Paul, when he says, I beseech you, he's imploring. He's earnestly imploring them by what? The mercies of God. God has been so merciful to every one of us. I was thanking God this morning for the, the magnitude and the gravity of the mercy he has given me and my family. And Paul was beseeching the church at Rome by the mercies of God. And what was he beseeching, imploring? That you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, H-O-L-Y, godly, sanctified, set apart. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God will never ask anything of you that's unreasonable. God will never ask you or demand of you or command you to do anything that is unreasonable out of your potential. God is, God is not ignorant. God is not stupid. God would not tell someone sitting in a church service, put a $100 bill in the offering plate, and God knows all you have is a 20. Now, the Holy Ghost may say, trust me, give the 20, and I'll bless you. But he will not ask anything unreasonable because that's not the kind of God that we serve. Sometimes you think, well, right now, in my walk with God, things are demanding, things are unreasonable. 
Oh, Lord, that's why we're, we're like children. Children will say, it's too hard. I can't do it. But we teach them, we train them, we admonish them, we show them. Moses said, show me thy way. The, the truth is today, we just don't spend enough time with God. I mean, th there's no way for me to, to, to soft soap this, soft pedal this. You just don't spend enough time in the presence of God. Oh, I'd like to see God move in greater ways in this ministry, though he's using us and we're touching people. I'm looking for bigger things, not for me, but for the Lord. I want a revival. Let me get back to Romans 12, 1. Verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world. This world will conform you as you submit yourself to it. This is why this wokeness, this stupidity, this absolute, it's mean, it is asinine. It is stupid. These people are absolutely stupid because they're conforming to demonic powers and entities and ideologies. I've never seen the stupidness the asininity, the, the craziness, the, the insanity, the madness that I see in America. And remember, in Deuteronomy 28, God said he would send madness in the land. What do you mean by that? Governor Abbott of Texas puts up razor wire, puts up the buoys out there in the, uh, the river, can't think of the name right now, but you know what I'm talking about. What does the Biden administration do when he does that? Sue the governor. Sue the governor and make him stop it, and then Biden turns around and begs for $20 billion for New York and Connecticut and, and these other sanctuary cities. H how stupid is that? How stupid is it to lock up the food, the deodorant, the shaving cream, the ice cream, and let the criminal go free? How stupid is that? These people are absolutely stupid, and they're running our nation into the ground and destroying it. You see, you remember what David said there in verse 1, evil doers. What they do is evil. Evil. You and me, we don't live like that. We don't go that way. That's why hell is going to break out in this nation. They want it, but I also perceive in my heart they too, they too are not prepared for the repercussions. I listened to a gentleman the other day. He's a layman. He's indirectly involved with the government. He went down to the border. He witnessed as five busloads of Chinese nationalists. His name is Kevin Jessup. Kevin Jessup, J-E-S-S-I-P. He's president of Global Strategic Alliance. Five busloads of Chinese nationalists with passports from Venezuela. They're not real, but they're fake. Came into America. China... China is infiltrating our land. That river was Rio Grande. China has bolted off our politicians. You see, when you become deceived, you perceive, you think what you're doing is right or okay, but it's not because you're deceived. A deceived man says the stop sign really means go. 
And the go means stop. He's got it backwards. This is what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 5 and 20. What happened in the last day? They would call evil good, good evil. They put light for darkness, darkness for light. Bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. They turn everything around. Look at this and in, in humanity, how they're trying to turn it around. Men are women and women are men, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is stupid. Asinine. Absolutely asinine. Be not conformed to this world, Paul said. I could, I could stand here, sit here, and preach on this for a day. Sit here for a whole day about conforming. We are conforming to the wrong things. We are conforming to the wrong spirit. We are conforming to the wrong people. Don't be conformed, Paul said, but be ye transformed. And as I said to you months ago, that word transformed, that's a godly, goodly word, but they want to transform, transgender. They want to, they want to change who and what we are. It's not possible. Your DNA is your DNA. You, you can cut, amputate, mutilate, eviscerate, cauterize. You, 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 you could do anything you want to do to your human body, but at the end of the day, you're either a man or a woman. Stupid. I've, I've often thought, <laughs> my Probably the most godly man I ever knew in my life was my grandpa. Had a third grade education, but had such wisdom. Just had profound wisdom. I could not explain to him today what's going on. He would, he would say, David, help me to understand this. And I would, pro I would probably try to explain to him. And he would say, I don't understand it. He was a True country boy. They killed hogs, cows, canned, churned butter. He'd sharpen his knife all day on Fridays. We'd meet at somebody's farm on Saturday and castorate piglets. 40, 50, 60 piglets at a time. Castorate them. They paid my papa a dollar a pig. <laughs> He, he would not understand this stupidity. He would say, uh, help me. Because he was not going to be conformed to the world, but he was being transformed by the renewing of his mind so that he might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If your mind is not being transformed by the quickening power of the Holy Ghost, you will not understand the will of God. What does Paul say about God's will? It is good, it is acceptable, and it is perfect. Now, where you find yourself right now may not be good. In your mentation, it might not be acceptable, and it might not be perfect. From your perspective, press in, press in, press in that you might understand what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then in verse 3, Romans 12, 3, for I say through the grace of God given to me to every man that is among you that a man ought not think. not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. To every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. The Greek word there is sobriety. Anything that affects your mind and negates your sobriety cannot be right in the sight of God. 
Can't do it. Think soberly. Think with sobriety according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. I don't know how much the measure is, but God has said through the Apostle Paul, we all have the measure of faith, not a measure, the measure. The measure could be the same for us all, but like working out, your faith increases because you step out in faith. You act in faith. You do things for God in faith, believing him, trusting him in, all, in everything. The will of God has already been established in heaven for you. Your job is to seek him to find that place. And many times, you know, we want God to do it just like that. It didn't happen like that with Abraham. It didn't happen like that with Joseph. It doesn't happen like that with nearly anyone. It is a process. You heard me elaborate on this probably a year or so ago. We don't like the process. We don't like the sausage grinder, do we? Just give us the sausage. Mix it up. The sage, the pepper, little brown sugar. Let's really make it hunky-dory. Before it gets to be sausage and seasoned like that, there was a pig, a hog. Whole. He was whole. He goes through this process for you and I. God's will is established in heaven. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Matthew 6, verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That tells me the will of God has been predetermined for all of us. It is established in the heavens. We are to come into alignment for that, that it might be executed, brought to fruition here on the earth. I cannot do that for you. I struggle to do that for myself. But this is why we delight ourselves in the Lord. And instead of really getting our heart's desire, our heart becomes conformed to God's will, and God's will is thoroughly executed in our lives. You know, God knows everything. He says to Jeremiah, I find it amazing the discourse between human beings and God. Mary probably had the greatest disposition. I know not a man, nevertheless at thy word so be it. I'm going to get pregnant. What's Joseph going to think? And I'm still a virgin. How difficult was that not only for Mary, how difficult was that for her husband, Joseph? See, God didn't leave Joseph hanging. God gave him words. He gave him dreams because God is faithful. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Predetermined, predestined, and Jeremiah wasn't even in his mother's womb. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Is that not the forethought, foreknowledge, preeminence, predestination, predetermination of God Almighty? Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. And all of this, these vain, worthless jack legs in the earth strive and contend with God in some, again, 
I hate to keep being redundant with the word, but it's stupid. <laughs> Jeremiah, before your mother ever conceived in her womb through your dad and her, I knew you, buddy. Before you came out of the womb, you were conceived. Something was brought forth, an egg and a, a sperm, a zoid came, and conception took place. But I knew you before that ever happened. <laughs> Is that not the infinite of God to make such declarations? I knew you before I formed you. Before you came out of your mother's belly, I ordained thee as a prophet unto the nations, predetermined, predestined. This is the way it was to go. This is why when Jeremiah began to, you know, he didn't contend with God, of course, but I'm young, I can't speak well, et cetera, et cetera. God said, just, just put all that aside. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Listen to this verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Praise God. Hallelujah. The good pleasure of his will. He doesn't say, Sorrowful, sad, evil pleasure, but the good pleasure of his will. God's will is perfect. It's we in our humanity that struggle with the perfection of God's will in our lives. Let me say this. When God touches your life, it's as though he paints a bullseye on your back. And the devil starts trying to destroy God's plan, God's will, God's predetermination, God's predestination for your life. He tries to disrupt it. I love the story of Moses, Jochebed, and his dad Amram. They saw he was different. Now, I don't know what Moses looked like in the sense that there was such a difference. They didn't throw him in the Nile. They hid him. There was something divine in Moses' life that his earthly parents could see it. They, 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 they could see something in his life that was far superior to what ever was there transpiring. The Bible says it this way. Jehokabed saw him that he was a goodly child. She hid him three months. What was God's will? You heard the old cliche, throw him in the creek. Throw him in the creek. <laughs> but he threw Moses into a river called the Nile. But God had a plan. Miriam. She took the child. The Bible says placed him in the flags, bulrushes, of the river's brink. And Miriam stands afar off to witness what's about to happen. Pharaoh's daughter, she's bathing herself. She saw the little ark in the bulrushes. She sent her maid, go fetch that, bring it to me. And when she opened it, 
She saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Now, how in the world would she know that was a Hebrew child at three months old? Circumcision. She recognized he was a Hebrew by an outward manifestation. Nevertheless, here she has this babe, and then guess who comes up? Miriam. Miriam. And then Pharaoh's daughter says, go and get a maid, and I'll pay her to nurse the child and take care of him while he's a baby. I'll even give you wages. You see the sovereignty of God. Jehokabed was paid wages to nurse her own baby. Don't you think God is not sovereign? Don't you ever think God is not in control? Don't ever think God cannot maneuver and make a way where there seemingly appears to be absolutely no way. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a will for your life. It is up to you. It is up to you to be conformed to it. Ephesians 1 and 5 The New Living Translation reads this way, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. The sovereignty of God is beyond our human comprehension. I believe the church, because the church is the body of Christ, Christ always was and has been, and if the church is his body, then the church too has always been. That's one of the mysteries, one of the mystiques regarding the church versus the humanity, the nationality of Hebrews slash Jews. But see, God, in the end, according to Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, he's going to bring both Jews and Gentiles together. Now, nobody but God can do things like that. I'm telling you, we serve a big God. Don't fret the evildoers. Don't grapple, don't struggle with the will of God. Seek the Lord. The more time you spend in prayer, the more time you spend in his presence, the more of his word that is deposited into your heart and life, the more clearer you will see and understand God, God's plan, God's will for your life. I would be derelict if I said, oh, that's easy. Sometimes it's difficult to discern the plan, the will of God. And when you're not able to discern it clearly, correctly, be still. I know some some of you are thinking, I'm tired of being still. You better be still. You'll make a mistake if you get out of God's will. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.